Welcome to the Rebooting Business Podcast, where we discuss how businesses can reboot, rebuild, and come back bigger and stronger than ever before in a post-COVID-19 reality. And now, here's your host, David Summerfleck. And hello, my name is David Summerfleck, and I am your host today. I'm a digital marketing specialist with about 20, 25 years experience working for different marketing agencies and probably another 10 or 20 working in other professions. We won't get into that. Thank you for watching or listening to another episode of Rebooting Business. My uh, guest today is Dave. Uh, Dave, what's your last name again? I'm having a senior moment. (laughs) Dave Walt. Thank you so much. I've got so much going on. Please forgive me. Uh, Dave Watts here. And Dave has a really great podcast called The Redundancy Podcast that I actually do remember and remember finally and enjoyed uh, speaking with um, Dave on. And so I invited him to come back so that we could actually talk about him for a change because I thought his background was particularly interesting. So, Dave, could we talk about your background and experience and as far as who you are, your professional background, and how you got started with the topic of redundancy and what that means to the listeners? Okay. Well, my professional background is one having joined Ford Motor Company directly from university. And my degree was in geography, so you can see that it's entirely appropriate for a Ford Motor Company. But we have something called the milk round in the UK, where the major manufacturers come on a recruitment drive, and they interview and take on graduates that they think are suitable. Mm -hmm. So I left straight from university, went to join Ford Motor Company in a junior sales and marketing role, had a fairly predictable career for the next eight to 10 years with them as I moved around the organization and moved around the country for them. Made a lovingly bad career move, which I rather not talk about. Joined the motor industry again after two years and then really pursued what I think you might describe as a portfolio career interrupted by a number of redundancies on the way. I ended up as a senior staff manager for a regional police force in the end, and I also worked 14 years as a uniform police officer. Mm. My staff role was made redundant at the end of 2017, and since then I've worked on a number of fixed-term contracts around the area where I live. Now, I don't want to interrupt you, I'm sorry, but when you say redundancy, you were made redundancy or you're found to be redundant, I mean, what does that mean? Does that mean that this one day a supervisor or someone met with you and just said, Dave, you know, you're a nice person or what have you, but you're obsolete or we're not needed. We're replacing you with someone younger or you were just let go and not really told what the reason was and you were left to kind of figure it out on your own. What did, What does that mean? Well, the labor laws in the UK are fairly strict and you can't just lay somebody else off or fire them unless they've done something particularly grievous right so there is a a, there is a process that legally organizations have to follow then and have to follow now Hmm. and you go through a series of conversations beforehand which talks about the reasons for the redundancy and they have to be legitimate and they have to be business-based so it isn't personal it is about a business and it is about a business taking a decision but yes nonetheless the first that most people know about it unless it's been highlighted in the press and an organization is going through a particularly bad time, is that you will get a request to go and meet someone from HR. And mm-hmm. then you start on the process and you follow it through until the day that you actually leave. Because, yeah, I've had similar experiences, as I'm sure we, we discussed, um, where the the particular place you're working at was going very uh, very well. Um, and then you come up for your annual renewal, your annual review, and you're informed, Hey, you know, everyone likes you, you and so on and so forth, but we've decided to to downsize or we're making cuts or what have you. And you, you know, 
instinctively or intuitively something uh, is going on or something's amiss. From my own experience, I've worked for many different types of marketing agencies. And um, I remember one of the last several agencies that I interviewed at, I remember walking in and being struck uh, there, these last two ones, actually, where you'd walk into the uh, lobby for the marketing agency. And I remember one, the founder of the agency was a man. Um, and he's standing like this, you know, like an emperor, literally surrounded in the photo by like 10 or 15 young girls in their teens or early 20s. And the only other male is like in a corner somewhere. And I've seen this in many, many marketing agencies where everyone is in their 20s. If the owner is a woman, all the employees are women, maybe one or two men in the back room somewhere. If the owner is a male, then all the employees are males with maybe one or two women or young girls put in the corner. And I don't use that term loosely. It's because of age. And I learned from the last several positions that I had at different marketing agencies that when I did see this, that you're really not going to fit in regardless of what your capabilities might be. So I stopped interviewing at agencies uh, really when I was in my 40s uh, because I realized, look, you're not going to get anything full time. It doesn't matter what you can or can't do. What matters is the perception. Do you think that was um, maybe uh, inappropriate or, 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 or you know, in, in compared to what you experienced? Do you think that was what I experienced was similar to, to what you experienced emotionally or what you saw? No, I don't think so. Again, although there are many ways to get rid of people legitimately, I think that in each of the on each of the occasions that my role was made redundant, and I do phrase it like that to be correct, my role was made redundant, I wasn't made redundant. I think there was a legitimate business reason mm. behind it. And I have to accept that much as I didn't like it, but I had to accept it. And the process goes through it. And because it's a panel affair, it's not an individual making the decision, HR involved and you have a right of appeal and a right of reply and furthermore you have a legal right to take it outside to a statutory agency if you think you've been unfairly dismissed. Mm. Organizations are very careful on the whole, they do make mistakes, but very careful on the whole of making sure that they follow the policy. So what I've been through are extremely brutal examples. I recall Ford Motor Company, not that I was made redundant from there, but being called in along with the rest of the sales and marketing force down to their head office near London. And up on the cinema screen, they had a huge plan of the new outline for the sales and marketing force. And some people's names weren't on there. And that's the first they knew about it. Mm -hmm. My name was, I was fine. So you go from that to the first time I was made redundant where, and I still got the letter, I was described as your, your role is made redundant and you are obsolete for the organization. Well, I felt like a bit of a filing cabinet at that mm. point. They were still, they were still following the process, but it was brutal. And I've seen the a panorama of examples of going from a brutal redundancy such as that through to an exemplar at the other side. So I accept that it's a statutory process. I accept it's a business decision. It just can be handled so ineptly at times. Yeah. And I think, you know, emotionally, uh, you know, I, I don't know how it is in the UK. Uh, I'm sure it's similar. But, you know, in much of the US, you know, men are socialized as, as young boys that, uh, you know, suck it up is a very popular expression or deal with it. Uh, but emotionally, it does hurt to some extent to know intellectually that you're giving everything that you can to this business. You're certainly you're doing your best to do an exemplary uh, job 
you know, I can't tell you how many agencies I worked at where I literally wrote books for the agency and all types of marketing material and advertising collateral that, you know, the average person would be paying thousands upon thousands of dollars for. You're going to conventions for them on their behalf and organizing it, that you, you know, and then being eliminated unceremoniously for no real fault of your own. Um, so what led you eventually to begin this interest in the topic of redundancy and then deciding to start a podcast? Well, as I said earlier, during my career, which really resembles snakes and ladders a lot of the time, I've had my role made redundant six times. Now, the first time, as you explained, it was enormously psychologically different, difficult. I had to stop on the way home after being made redundant and mm. compose myself in a lay-by before I could drive on and home and tell my wife about it. And I was very, very yeah. bitter for two weeks once I'd actually left the office because it was very much a, are you still here? Would you please like to go now? But after two weeks, I realized nobody else is going to sort this out for me. I was going to have to do it for myself. Yeah. And at that point, I switched on and I realized it's down to me. I've got to sort it out. And when the other redundancies came along, Sometimes I got an inkling because you do begin to get a sense, but it is a break in the psychological contract that you have yes. as an organization. Yes. The deal is I'll work for you and I'll put my family to one side at some point and I'll be an exemplar of the corporate player. But the deal is you look after me and you keep me on. Well, once they break that, then you don't become cynical because that suggests there's, you see no good in the world, but you can become skeptical about organizations. And it was at that point I thought, any decision, business decision I take in the future will be for the good of me and my family and not for the organization I work for. I will, of course, go in and do the very best job I can do, but I won't get fooled again, if I could put it like that. So after the sixth redundancy and you become used to it and you become habituated, and think, well, I know what to do. I can sort this out. I'll find another job. And I did six times find another job. I thought, I've been through this. I've made some mistakes. I've had a lot of successes. I've had a few failures. I think I can share that with people because there will be other people of my age that will be going through this who may not have any real idea what to do. And that really was what impelled me to start the podcast. I'll share these ideas, but I'm going to do it in a different way. I'm not just going to talk about redundancies. I want to talk to academics, for example, to look at the structural reasons behind the labor market changing. I wanted to talk to career experts to get their view and advice and give some pragmatic help. But I also wanted to talk to individuals who, who'd been affected to get their story so they could share what had worked for them and what had been less successful and then use that as a platform to share it with many others who I, who I deduced or I suspected were in my particular position. And you have attracted a good many uh, listeners. And I think that the topic is not only for people your own age, but for those of us who may be a few years younger. I think you have me beat by maybe a, a handful of years. But um, people, you know, younger, people older, and, and maybe even for, you know, college age uh, students who are concerned about what could be waiting for them down the road. Um, so what lessons and insights have you gained from talking with so many varied individuals on the topic of redundancy to this point? Um, and I'll just leave it at that before I interject anything else. Well, that's a very good question. and. I've been fortunate in that I have an, a wide international audience and I've been able to speak to people from many countries in the world. What do I know? Everybody is likely to suffer from some form of ageism at some point, and it seems to be the last acceptable prejudice out there. You talked about the younger people just a few minutes ago. You talked to young people, college students coming out. They talked to me about the phrases around the, you're too young. Yes. You're not qualified enough. Yeah, You don't have enough experience. You can't get the experience, of course, until somebody gives you the chance to develop the experience. Yeah. You're going to leave as soon as you can for another slightly better job. And if you compare that to the opposite with older people, 
you're too old, you're overqualified, you're wrongly qualified, your qualifications are out of date, you can't evidence your qualifications, you're going to be bored and leave. So you can see there are parallels, as you rightly say, between whatever age people are. And that age is going to come in. But what I do, what I have found is that internationally, this problem with employment as an older worker and challenges can be found in any country, whether it's the UK, the States, New Zealand, Australia, Canada. I found it everywhere. And there's a real resonance, I think, in every country. And I think that's why I get the listeners that I do where I get the listeners I do. Hmm. Have you... Well, let me, um, how do you, how do you, the career paths of younger adults, such as those in their twenties compared to those in their fifties and above, they're both trying to find their own path, but have you observed other parallels or similarities that both sides of the coin could learn from? Another great question. When I talk to older workers and incidentally, I've changed the title of my podcast when i started originally podcasting it was the challenges of finding work when you're 60 and older and then people started telling me oh no older starts at 45 you you have yeah. to understand that that's where ageism is coming in that's where people are beginning to worry and it's quite right and that's why i changed the title of challenges for older workers because it's a much broader church than i ever thought i'm unusual in that I have a portfolio career. I think now I've worked for 14 different organizations. I'm in my mid sixties, but that's unusual for people my age because when I speak to my contemporaries, most of them have worked for one or possibly two for most of their working lives. Mm. If I speak, and when I do speak to younger people, they've no intention of working for the same organization for that length of time. They see portfolio careers as the norm that's what they're going to do. I don't think you could. And again, I don't know about the economies of uh, the UK and other countries. I wish I was more informed on that topic. I can only speak from my own experiences and knowing people in different marketing agencies that I, I toiled in. Um, it was very, like I said, it was very unusual to see anyone uh, in their 30s, much less in their 40s or 50s, unless it was the owner. You'd very, very seldom see anyone. And it was just considered unusual. Just If I went to any marketing agencies here where I live now, uh, geographically, uh, it's, it's extremely unlikely anyone would be in their 30s or, or older, unless they are owners of the agency or very, very senior ranking people. Um, and that's that's why... Uh, you know, the last agency I worked at, I, I knew intellectually, it, you're not going to be able to get another full time position, at least not through a physical brick and mortar. They don't employ people above the age, that age, unless you got in somehow or you know someone. I think that's right. I speak, I've spoken to people in New Zealand, and in particular, a journalist there who's in his late 50s and has had his role made redundant. And he tells the same story about journalism in New Zealand. The people that are interviewing, if he even gets an interview, yeah. are in their 30s. And they're asking questions which he says are unloaded, which they know that he won't be able to answer because they have different skills and different views. And it's a sort of a subtle way of filtering people out and yet still playing the game as far as legislation goes. So yes, I recognize that. And I recognize that a lot of organizations do play these stereotypes about age. And those stereotypes are very dangerous. They are. And they they create problems, not just for the employers, uh, because obviously you have employees who are cogs in a machine. And I'm sure they feel that way to a large extent. Um, I certainly did. But you, you know, you, you feel like you're in a cog in a machine. There are no mentorship programs for most companies within the U.S. that I've seen. But again, my exposure has been limited to marketing and advertising agencies. But for the most part, there were no mentorship programs. Obviously, the benefits of older, more mature employees is simply increased experience, um, enhanced social skills where 
you know, we know how to get along with people in diffuse situations. Whereas certainly, uh, you know, I don't know about you, Dave, but obviously when I was in my 20s, I was more uh, likely to, you know, lose my cool or something. Whereas now that I'm older, I know to be, let's have a cup of coffee and talk about what's going on here. What's really beneath the surface that I wouldn't have done in my 20s. Um, so the, the the employers are sacrificing those aptitudes and those capabilities. But based on what you experienced and the people you've spoken to on your podcast, if you're someone in your 50s or older, or for that matter, if you're in your 30s and you're being shown the exit through no fault of your own, what can you do? How do you persevere emotionally so you're not... Um, you know, emotional detritus or something. You know what I mean? How how do you persevere through that? We have COVID-19 in the U.S. And I think to some limited extent in the U.K., you have social upheaval and, on you know, economic issues on top of it. Now you've got this issue of ageism um, in addition to discrimination and others. How do we persevere based on what you've seen? It's difficult because it is a grieving process when you yeah. lose your job. And I'd say it's a bit like a grieving process. If you say, if you're going to lose a relative or a loved one, you know, intellectually, even if somebody says you're going to grieve, it doesn't really make any difference. You're still going to grieve. And that's the same with redundancy. It's still a grieving process. So I'd say to anybody, you are going to go down very quickly. You're going to bump along the bottom, but eventually you will come back up again. Now, I can't say how long it's going to take anybody to bump back up again. It depends, but there is a grieving process. But there are, I think, some universal answers that I found across the world. And it's don't give up is, is the biggest one ever, because there's only you that are going to get out of it. The world actually doesn't care that you're unemployed you don't have a right to work so you can't give up and you have to keep on going and you're going to have to find levels of resilience that you didn't know you had have and that's you, hard yeah have you heard of victor frankel no who's he victor frankel well he's deceased now but he was a man who uh survived the nazi concentration camps and he wrote a book that's an old favorite of mine called man's search for meaning it's a short read, actually. You could probably read it, if, you know, sitting in a nice lazy boy chair for two or three hours at the most. And I've always felt like it would make a great movie. And um, but anyway, Victor went on to become a psychologist, I believe, if I have all my details straight. But the book was about his experiences in the camps. And I don't remember if it was Dachau or Buchenwald or where it was, but he said that he found that the people who survived the concentration camps were not always the most physically fit or the most muscular chaps or not even the youngest. But he found that the people who survived were the ones who felt a direct uh, connection to a, a, a sense of meaning. And the meaning did not have to be, um, you know, career. You know what I mean? For example, well, I, uh, I'm a writer, so I need to have a notebook and a pen. Well, in a concentration camp, you're not going to have a notebook and a pen. You're not going to have a stone and a chisel to write on, you know? So for him, the sense of meaning was, he said that he would always replay in his mind seeing his daughter's next birthday. That he, he said that one pivotal moment was watching the sun come up with some of the other prisoners or it was just like giving someone a wink and a nod as they were being led away um so that was what led him to survive and to yeah, make and it you know it's is those levels of resilience and finding something to hang on to yeah and of course of course it's a big problem for you if you think that you're defined entirely by your work and your title and your status and you've got a large prestigious german car parked in your garage then you might struggle 
I'd say, and, yeah. Uh, you might struggle and find it difficult if you suddenly find you've got no income going and you've got to go and sign on as unemployed in whatever state you live or whichever country you live, because that's never going to be the most endearing process, is it? No, and I think that's for some people who have their sense of identity caught up in materialism or status. Mm -hmm. And it's really easy to get drawn into that. You know, I remember winning awards for one or two of the agencies that I worked at. And you feel so proud looking up on the wall and seeing these awards that you have, but they're not yours. I didn't get them. You know what I mean? I got them as an employee through the agency. Um, you could take them home with you if the agency shows you the door, but then they always have this association. You know what I mean? I do. I know exactly. And I, I recorded a podcast two days ago with an older worker who's in his late 60s, mid 60s. And he had been a senior marketing manager for most of his working life. And because of COVID-19 has lost his job. It's mm. been made redundant. And the, it's a, the marketing world has changed enormously and there just aren't any senior marketing jobs in the London area. I think he quoted the fact there have been four senior marketing jobs only in the last four months in London. So it's gone. I'd love to talk to him. I think I could help him. Uh, you but know, but, but what he's done. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go right ahead. The, 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 the important thing that he's done is he's got a job. And I said, well, what job have you got? Given it's COVID-19 and you're in your uh, mid 60s. He said, I'm a delivery driver for one of the UK's largest online grocery companies. And I said, how do you feel about that? He said, great, because I'm doing something that's given me purpose. Mm. I go in at seven o'clock in the morning, I've got 18 to 20 deliveries to make, often to vulnerable people, they're thanking me. I get a great deal of satisfaction out of it. And I think there's someone that's put aside the pips on the shoulder, the status thing, and said, I wanna work, I wanna do something with purpose, and I'm going to go out and get a job. And I admire that greatly because he's done what a lot of people wouldn't do and put that pride on one side and gone out to get work. Right. And conversely, by the, you know, conversely, by the, the, the same token, you could just you could just as soon uh, say, I know many people are, are teaching online um, hmm. on my own website. I have a, a blog post. Um, I don't, I, I think it's called freelancing successfully. I don't remember the title exactly, but I've given the link to many different people who are facing this. And I just say, well, here are my thoughts on the topic. I don't have all the solutions, but I have lists of sites that are legitimate, that, that do hire remotely. You could be, let's be honest. You shouldn't have to go and physically sit in an office right now. No. it's not necessary to get work done. It wasn't necessary 20 years ago and it damn sure isn't necessary now. But, um, you know, it, it's, I, I try to help where I can with that, but it's, it's so important not to have your sense of, um, of self-worth tied up to the perceptions of others, you know, especially during such tumultuous times. Um, would you say that the, the, the matter of redundancy, how, I don't know if how much you've traveled or haven't tra traveled, would you say it's a UK based issue or that it may seem more prevalent in some cultures or countries compared to others? I'd be very fortunate in that I've been able to travel much of the world with either with my job or on a personal basis. Oh, you are, you are very fortunate. <laughs> I envy that. I haven't traveled anywhere for the last four months. I'm mm. lucky to get out of the town where I live. But I have been fortunate to go from North America to South America, across most of Europe and across the far Middle East and as far as Japan. So I, d I do feel that I have a view about what's going on. It isn't a UK issue. It is an international issue. I spoke to a professor from one of the British universities back in November and he then, we were talking about the structural problems of finding work for older workers. Mm. And his research quite clearly shows that whether you're in the States, whether you're in the UK, whether you're in France, Germany, Spain, New Zealand, Canada, it's the same issue, the same problems are facing. And it's a 
natural function of capitalism. It's something that we all have to put up with. And it's part of the benefits that we get from capitalism as organisations change in size and take on or reduce their labour. That, I think, is something we accept. But it's what you then do with the people once they've lost their job. Because most people, virtually everybody, I think, is driven by a sense of purpose. Whatever you're doing in life, you want to have a sense of purpose that you feel productive and you're contributing something. And to be ripped from your job and to be left wherever you live at home with that, that sense of purpose, I think is a difficult thing to do. Particularly, as in most countries, the population is getting older as a proportion rather than younger. So you've got a whole bunch of very successful, very experienced, talented people without a real opportunity to use that for society in any real way. Mm. And that's a huge difficulty. Indeed. Um, and, and, you know, I, and I think that's why it's so important for, for more and more people to get online and explore remote employment, working from home, uh, working online, whatever you want to call it. Um, I'm always torn between looking for more work online, taking on more clients, or just saying, you know what, read more books, focus on writing more and better books, and just be done with that. And I, I guess the middle ground is to do some combination thereof. But it can be done and it can be balanced, I do believe. Um, have you explored much in your podcast or your own experiences? Uh, I call it ageism. It could be redundancy, age discrimination, as it relates specifically to people of color, women, transgender individuals, and other more typically oppressed, uh, marginalized groups. Is it becoming more pronounced for them, or is it just one more straw on the camel's back, so to speak? There are levels. I've spoken to... Dr. Sarah Vickerstaff of Kent University in the UK, and she's an eminent professor in, again, workplace, particularly coming up to the end of working life. And I spoke to her in one podcast about the particular challenges that older women face. Now, I thought I knew quite a lot about this, but she opened my eyes to an enormous amount of additional challenges. Women are faced with, for example, divorce and having to find an income later on in life. They're faced with the difficulties of working in the service sector, which for most women in whatever country you live in tends to be typically much harder physical work. Yes. And therefore, they tend to suffer more medical conditions. Her research shows that many women are reluctant to bring up those medical conditions with their employers because they feel they'll be laid off from their job because their employers feel they're not able to do it or they're not willing to pay for their medical care wherever you live that women feel trapped by poor pensions and therefore they see themselves having to work for longer, longer lives. So mm -hmm. an enormous amount of issues. I'm speaking in a couple of weeks' time to yet another professor about long-term service leavers from the military to talk about the issues that they face in particular. Many of us, and I perhaps this is a case for you, I made a serious career decision years ago, but I had a safety net. I was able to go back into the car industry. That's my safety net. For the military, if you come out, you don't have a safety net because you can't go back into the military. So there are issues there. I've got a podcast scheduled to talk to one of your fellow Americans, a physically disabled individual who's overcome enormous personal obstacles to get jobs. I've not been able to speak to anybody about the BAME community, the black and minority ethic. I would love to talk to someone who's able to talk mm. about the additional challenges that they face as well. Well, we've got to find a way to hook you up. Um, if anybody is watching this on YouTube or, or listening to this and you want to reach out to Dave and, and, and talk about uh, this topic, um, I don't know if Dave likes it or not, but I would encourage you to get in touch with him. I think I it's it. Love <laughs> So before we say goodbye, uh, please make sure that you give your contact information, Dave, if I don't ask you for that. Um, let me see what other questions I've got for you. Is there anything that you feel employers could or sh should do? I, I know this is an open-ended question. 
to better address ageism and age discrimination in the workplace. And what do you see others doing to address it, if anything? It depends on the organization. If you look at the public sector in the UK, for example, they do quite a good job at trying to take out as far as you possibly can age discrimination from the recruitment process, indeed any form of discrimination from the recruitment process, by dint of the questions they ask and the way that they deal with it in the interview and all of those issues. And in particular, the one that I think is most, uh, or rather a very good example of a very good application form is one from the British Home Office of all places, another public sector one naturally, but a very good application system. And it really does focus in on your key skills and experience and strips everything else out. And organizations can do that. I think as you get down towards the smaller organizations and you've already described some of the issues where you've got an owner driver in effect, much harder to deal with that. Mm. It's also very difficult in most countries to bring any form of legal action against age discrimination because of the difficulties of actually proving it and the costs of taking it to court. Right. Yeah. You need to have some kind of an email or something or a, yeah. a physical letter saying we're dismissing you on the basis of your age, which there are some fools you know, out there who will do that, but very few. Yeah. Most of them will invite you outside to the yard and look up to make sure there's no CCTV cameras. Go no witnesses, you're fired, go. And that's that's often what happens, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And ask for it by email if you can. I, I, the whole thing is just, it's a topic, obviously, I feel strongly about. Um, now, did you have any questions for me, Dave? Because we've talked about this topic before, and I wasn't sure. Yeah, I know that in the States, you have different labor laws. And I know that it is a particular issue. You've got Chip Conley is well known for his work on the benefits of age diversity in organizations. Mm. And I know in Canada, there's what top 60 over 60 run by Helen Hirsch Benz, Pfizer run by Wendy Mayhew in the UK, we've got amongst other aging betters. Now I've spoken to the American Association of Rep Retired Persons as well, in terms of the work that they're doing. But do you see in the States, any relief against ageism, or do you see much the same problems that I've been describing across the rest of the world? I don't see anything changing anytime soon, certainly. And I'm not going to get into politics right now as much as I, the topic always gets my blood pressure up. But um, I don't see anything changing anytime soon. I mean, obviously in the US and probably for the rest of the world, there's so much going on to distract us from this uh, that you could argue is more important, I don't know, or more immediate. I don't see anything changing on that anytime soon. What I do see is for people of that age or with that concern, the option of going more in the direction of saying uh, that they need to declare their own um, independence from the monolithic employer employee um uh, d dichotomy that that outdated relationship where you're wholly dependent upon the employer for your livelihood mm. i've been in positions where you know you you're living paycheck to paycheck i wasn't at that position for too long thank god but you know, if the employer lets you go, you may have one or two or three paychecks worth of uh, savings. But in many cases, it takes you more than three or four months to find gainful employ, or the next job that you have may not pay what the previous employer uh, paid. So I think it's really vital or let's, let's just say I'm a strong advocate of people finding their own uh, stability in an uncertain world during tumultuous times like what we're going through now. So if you're working at a job and you feel very happy and very stable there, um, you know, that's great. 
but I, I think everybody should take advantage of what's available online and it, at the very least send out feelers mm -hmm. uh, and begin investigating you know other avenues of what you could be doing even if it's something that you would not ordinarily think of of doing you know i was an english teacher for some time uh briefly and the idea of teaching english to children in china and you know acting silly and puppets and everything i'm just not that type of guy um but if i needed the money would i do it yeah yeah i would try it i would try it and i think people should be more open to that embrace technology and you know don't be afraid to wade into that pool um so i hope that answers the question it does and my final question would be what about self-employment in the times of covid is that something that's viable do we think yeah very much so um there are i would probably say that most of these employers who are employing online and for me i don't really take the employer seriously unless it is also remote meaning work from home so i'll i'll give the listeners or or, or viewers out there a, uh, an example of this and i think i told you this as well when i was on your podcast uh, if there's a very popular search engine specifically for jobs called indeed.com okay which is kind of a misbranded name for a job search engine i would think it would be job.com but anyway if you go to indeed.com where it says location type in the word remote and that's it then go through the listings and see what, what what suits your fancy if you're looking for something very specific such as a copywriter type in copywriter and then put in remote under location and see what you get if you're someone who is obviously comfortable working in a physical office situation right now which i don't but if you do then you could certainly type in your geographic location um so I, I i do think that working remotely independently online is viable for many people that being said a lot of these employers are being deluged uh with resumes and applications right now and it's like that um the the the, the metaphor you know being the captain of the football team in high school or the uh the prom queen in high school everybody wants to talk to you so the employers are sitting on the top of that throne if you will um so you know you can apply will you get something back i don't know will it be sufficient to earn a livable wage i don't know but i do know it exists you know and it's that old marketer in me that just says leave no stone unturned if there's a way to reach more clients or more customers, do that. So from the perspective of the job seeker or the person 55 or, or obsolete or, or redundant, don't take that line down. Look at your situation like a Rubik's cube and say, how can I change this? If it means teaching English to children in China uh four or five hours a day and then going to another website and teaching a yoga class online for four or five hours a day and then editing text on fiverr or whatever for four or five hours a day which in the u.s they call the gig economy you don't get benefits so in the u.s we don't have the the uh, national health care system that you you guys do in the uk so here it's based on how much money you make or your employer so that's a true 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 deficit um but it is what it is and if you need to put food on the table i encourage people to do that and like i said if you go to my own website dms.blue you go to the blog page and there's a little search box and you can just type in the word freelancing and look for that blog post and it has lists on it you know um any other questions I always have a blast talking to you, Dave. <laughs> I've really enjoyed it again. Thank you very much. It, it is a real pleasure talking to you. Thanks.
Well, you're always so relaxed and everything, and you always have really good, insightful uh, comments as well. Uh, and obviously, it's a topic that I'm very passionate about. So um, I'll tie things up into a, a bow here and just say, uh, this is David Summerfleck with the Re Rebooting Business Podcast. I almost said redundancy. The Rebooting <laughs> Business Podcast. This is what happens when you don't have enough caffeine in the morning. And uh, my gracious host, Mr. Dave Watts of the Redundancy uh, Podcast. If you have found this podcast helpful in any way or entertaining, please give it a thumbs up on YouTube, subscribe, give it a positive review. Every little bit helps. We move a mountain, not in one day, but with a shovel over generation. So give it that if you may. Um, and let's see here. If you have any uh, questions that you would like to ask to be featured on the podcast, please check out our, our, our footnotes or program notes. Um, along with this podcast or video and please check us out where podcasts are found and dave how can our listeners get in touch with you and find your contact information well thank you they can either contact me via my website the redundancy podcast.com there's a contact page there or by emailing me direct at the redundancy podcast at gmail.com all right and there you have it and uh, thank you, everyone, for watching or listening. And thank you again, uh, Dave, for being my guest today. And please hang around with me for another minute or two as I push some buttons. A pleasure, Dave. Thank you very much. Okay, hang around. You've been listening to Rebooting Business, the podcast for, about, and by America's small business owners who are ready to reboot and rebuild businesses in a post-COVID-19 world. To learn more about rebooting your business or be a guest on the podcast, please visit www.dms.blue today.